The Russian word vranyo means to lie, but to lie in a way where everyone knows you're lying but pretends to believe it anyway. Since the days of the Soviet Union, this has been an expected part of how the Russian government operates. Dishonesty is just the norm, as is a lack of transparency. Unlike the US or UK, Russia does not have a regular policy of declassification that exposes the nefarious things it has gotten up to. What we know about what goes on behind the scenes in Russia is thanks to foreign intelligence services, defectors, or journalists and activists who risk their lives to expose Russian secrets. We may not know nearly as much about Russia's secrets as we do about their American counterparts, but what we do know is still fascinating. Today, on A Day in History, we get a glimpse at some of the secrets that Russia has tried and failed to keep hidden. So stick around to the end to learn how Russia killed someone with an umbrella, how they helped get the Prime Minister of India assassinated, and how Russia tried to manipulate US politics during and after the 2016 election. Don't forget to leave a like on this video and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. In order to keep things secret, Russia has perfected the art of the cover-up, and it seems there's no disaster too big for them to try and hide from the world. On several occasions, the Russian government tried to cover up colossal environmental disasters. The one everyone knows is Chernobyl. Before the 1986 disaster, the authorities had actually covered up several safety issues at the sites to quote, prevent panic and provocative rumors. This culture of dishonesty and lack of accountability contributed to the 1986 disaster and explains the Soviet government's delayed response. When an explosion during a botched safety test killed two workers in April 1986, causing uncontrollable fires and expelling vast amounts of radioactive material, it took almost two days for the authorities to inform the local population. They had delayed because they'd hoped to contain the problem without anyone noticing. This delay was fatal. On top of the 30 plant workers and emergency responders who died from radiation poisoning, thousands of people were exposed to dangerous amounts of radiation, causing devastating and sometimes fatal health effects for decades to come. However, the reason the Russians tried to cover up Chernobyl was simple. They'd done it before. On 29th of September 1957, improperly stored nuclear waste at a facility near the modern city of Ozyorsk exploded. No one was hurt in the initial explosion, but it dispersed huge amounts of radioactive material into the atmosphere. Radioactive dust was scattered for 20,000 square kilometers. While most of it was uninhabited, it still included several villages, towns, and river systems that carried the contamination far and wide. Because of strict security policies, no one outside of the plant and the authorities were told about the accident for a week. For days, thousands of residents carried on with their lives even though radioactive dust was sitting on every surface, contaminating all their food and water and filling all their lungs. It took until the 6th of October for the first people to be evacuated, but even they weren't told why. Rumors of an accident circulated in the Western press, but it wasn't until 1976 that a Soviet defector exposed what had really happened. The Mayak disaster was one of the largest nuclear disasters in history, second only to Chernobyl in the amount of radioactive material released. Hundreds of people died from radiation sickness linked to the disaster, and an uncountable number suffered long-term health effects like cancer. And so many of those could have been avoided if the Russian government had been more transparent, and acted sooner when the disaster struck. But some problems can't be covered up, they can only be disposed of. The Russian KGB proved no less creative than their CIA rivals in finding inventive ways to get rid of their problems for good. Take the assassination of Bulgarian journalist Georgi Markov in September 1978. Markov was broadcasting anti-Soviet and anti-communist messages, 
but the KGB didn't want to make the assassination too obvious in case it inspired more resistance. Their solution? An umbrella. Nicknamed the Bulgarian Umbrella, the Soviet authorities designed a pellet gun that looked like a simple umbrella, but it could fire a deadly pellet of rice and poison into its target at close range. On the 7th of September 1978, an agent secretly injected Markov with a rice and pellet as he walked across Waterloo Bridge in London. Markov only noticed a small stinging pain in his leg and went on with his day as normal. He was rushed to the hospital that evening and died a few days later, but the culprit was never caught. That was hardly the last time the Russians killed someone off with poison, or even did it in London. One of the most famous recent cases was the murder of Alexander Litvinenko. Litvinenko was an FSB defector and Putin critic, who accused the Russian government of various crimes including staging bomb attacks on their citizens and assassinating journalists. In late 2006, Litvinenko had several meetings with two men who turned out to be KGB agents. These men used the opportunity to lace Litvinenko's tea with polonium-210, a deadly radioactive substance that emitted almost undetectable alpha radiation into its victim's body when ingested. Similarly to Markov, Litvinenko had no idea anything was wrong at first, but after a few days of vomiting, weakness and unexplained bleeding, he was rushed to hospital. By the time doctors determined that he'd been poisoned, it was far too late to save him, if he could have ever been saved at all. Before he died, Litvinenko firmly accused the Russian government of poisoning him. Multiple investigations from the British government and the European Court of Human Rights have agreed beyond a reasonable doubt that Russia had him killed, and Putin probably ordered it himself. Russia denies the accusations, but practically no one believes them. Vranyo is still the rule of the day. Sometimes though, Russia prefers not to get its hands dirty. General Alexander Sakharovsky, a key figure in the KGB, once told a colleague that terrorism should become our main weapon, and Russia is more than willing to support it to achieve its goals. During the days of the USSR, the KGB poured money, arms and training into terrorist groups and criminal organizations across the world. Fellow communists, or simply people who'd opposed the US and its allies, were fair game for support from Moscow. People like the Venezuelan Marxist terrorist known as Carlos the Jackal were known to be KGB assets. The Jackal committed dozens of bombings throughout the 1970s, and famously led an armed attack on the headquarters of OPEC in Vienna in 1975, killing at least 11 people and wounding hundreds more. Another recipient of Russian terrorist funding was the IRA. Unrest in Ireland was a perfect way to destabilize the United Kingdom, while supporting a group that shared the USSR's far-left politics. Starting in 1972, the KGB secretly shipped assault rifles, machine guns, pistols, explosives, and ammunition to the IRA. Some of these weapons would be used in the string of terrorist attacks that hit Northern Ireland and Britain in the following decades, which killed thousands of people, most of them civilians. But by far the biggest terrorist partner of Russia were Palestinian groups, especially the Palestinian Liberation Organization PLO. Documents from East Germany show that over $2 million worth of ammunition a year was being sent to Palestinian terror groups in Lebanon by the 1970s, and another source from Czechoslovakia showed that the USSR supplied over a thousand tons of plastic explosives to Islamist terror groups in the Middle East. Yasser Arafat, who was chairman of the PLO for decades, was in regular contact with the KGB by the early 1970s and KGB agents were secretly training their terrorists in military tactics. The PLO was especially fond of airplane hijackings, which the KGB helped plan. Sakharovsky even claimed that the KGB had practically invented the idea of the airplane hijacking during their work with the PLO. 
Russian equipment and Russian training were intimately involved in a string of deadly terrorist attacks in Israel in the 1970s. The Lod Airport massacre in May 1972, which killed 22 people, the deaths of 18 people in the Savoy Hotel attack of March 1975, and the Zion Square bombing that killed 15 in July 1975 are just some of the attacks that have been linked to Russian equipment or Russian training. The funding of Islamist terror groups didn't stop with the fall of the USSR either. In 2006, weapon caches abandoned by the Lebanese terror group Hezbollah were found to be of Russian origin and contained modern Russian military equipment. Even when Russia hasn't been funding terrorist groups directly, its weapons have often ended up in the hands of illicit groups. Weapons left over from the Soviet war in Afghanistan were used to take thousands of NATO and Afghan lives in the hands of the Taliban. While weapons and equipment poured into Syria to support Bashar al-Assad found their way into the hands of the Islamic State. Russia has also specialized in subversion to advance its interests indirectly. Throughout the Cold War and beyond, Russia has become skilled in manipulating other groups and conflicts abroad to weaken its enemies and create new allies. An obvious target for manipulation was the civil rights movement in the United States. Operation Pandora was the KGB's active measure to cause racial conflict in the US by staging false flag attacks and blaming them on different racial and religious groups. In 1971, KGB agents in New York were ordered to plan a bomb attack on one of the historically black colleges in New York and pin the blame on Jewish groups. They also planned to distribute propaganda material aimed at key groups like the Ku Klux Klan and the Black Panthers to foment racial conflict in the streets. Fortunately, US counterintelligence foiled the plan before any serious action could be taken. The Russians had more success against US allies abroad, such as Israel. Russia viewed Israel as a US puppet and wanted to encourage Muslims in the region to destroy it by amplifying anti-Semitic feelings and on top of supporting anti-Semitic terrorist groups like the PLO. In 1972, Russia launched the Shinitskye Gosudarstva SIG, with the sole aim of fueling anti-Semitism in the Middle East. 4,000 agents were trained to spread anti-Semitic conspiracies, and the Russians produced piles of anti-Semitic literature to be distributed in the Middle East. The main text they used was the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a book invented in Russia in the early 20th century, which claimed that the Jews were operating a global conspiracy to take control of the world. To this day, the anti-Semitic literature distributed by the Russians is still circulating, and the fierce anti-Semitism in many parts of the Muslim world owes itself, in part, to the SIG program. Another target for manipulation was India. India was the most important non-aligned nation in the world during the Cold War, and Moscow had a vested interest in shifting its neutrality. Their tool would be the ongoing ethnic and religious tensions between India's Hindus and the Sikh minority. In the early 1980s, the KGB began a campaign of misinformation to convince Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi that the CIA and Pakistan's ISI were secretly supporting Sikh separatist movements in the Punjab region to weaken India. Russia presented itself as a concerned third party who was merely protecting India from American schemes. The accusations were false. There was absolutely no evidence whatsoever of any US or Pakistani involvement in any Sikh separatist conspiracy. But Russian agents leaned on journalists, politicians, and the Prime Minister's own family to spread the lie. Indira Gandhi was eventually convinced. In June 1984, she launched Operation Blue Star, a coordinated strike on Sikh dissidents centered on the Golden Temple in Amritsar, which is one of the holiest sites in Sikhism. The fighting dragged on for a week and cost the lives of hundreds of Indian soldiers, Sikh fighters, and civilians. 
This would be catastrophic enough on its own, but the event so angered some Sikhs that two of Indira Gandhi's own Sikh bodyguards assassinated her a few months later. This in turn provoked anti-Sikh riots that killed thousands across India. It wasn't until much later that India discovered that the KGB had been lying in the first place, with one Indian politician saying Operation Blue Star might never have happened if not for the vast disinformation of the KGB. But when it comes to Russian disinformation, we can't avoid talking about the United States. The 2016 US election saw immense interference from Russian propagandists on social media who spread thousands of political posts and images to millions of users full of disinformation and misdirection. A group of scholars investigating the phenomenon stated clearly that Russian propaganda activity between 2015 and 2016 was designed to benefit President Trump's campaign. Russian influence campaigns were designed to appeal to Trump-leaning groups, such as veterans and gun owners, while demonizing groups like Democrats, Muslims, and immigrants. False claims about immigrant crime rates, conspiracy theories about Democratic people on networks, and accusations that Obama was mistreating veterans were just some of the content that Russian propaganda focused on. Alongside the pro-Trump messaging, Russia operated networks of pro-Southern identity groups, with names like Heart of Texas and Southern Identity that promoted resentment against Washington and the Obama administration. It should be said that there is no evidence whatsoever linking the Trump campaign to these groups. Instead, it seems the Russians decided on their own that a Trump victory was in their best interests. Why they thought that is a bit harder to answer. It wasn't just the political right that was targeted with Russian propaganda. Russia also operated networks to target traditionally left-wing groups, especially Black Americans, LGBT, and Mexican Americans. Russia ran several Black nationalist pages with titles like Blacktivist and Black Matters that reached millions of viewers. These pages promoted Black ethno-nationalism and promoted content discussing police brutality and incarceration, which was seen as expressions of systemic racism in American society. According to a comprehensive study in 2018, Black nationalism and Black identity politics attracted the largest cluster of Russian propaganda ads in the period 2012 to 18. Similar ideas were spread among the LGBT networks that Russia operated, with a focus on instances of homophobia and transphobia while promoting the idea that US institutions were hostile to LGBT people. In both cases, Russia propaganda tried to undermine US democracy and promote Donald Trump by urging black and LGBT people not to vote because the systems were already rigged against them. Mexican-American audiences were targeted with pro-immigration messaging that attacked the US government's immigration policy, but almost all of it came after Trump's election and seized upon Trump's harsher immigration policy to rile up anger against the government. Around 40 million people liked and shared content from secret Russia propaganda sources on social media around the 2016 election and millions more would see this content without interacting with it. It's too far to say that Russia elected Trump or created black opposition to him, but they did recognize the forces at play in US politics and manipulated them to undermine and divide the United States. Their overarching goal seems to have been the destabilization of the US. On one hand, they seemed to believe that Trump would weaken the US and supported his election. At the same time, they amplified his opponents and encouraged them to lose faith in the police, the voting systems, and the US government itself. Russia wanted to create a weak and divided America. Whether they succeeded is up to you to judge. We can only get a tiny glimpse of what goes on behind closed doors in Russia. Moscow isn't getting any more open about its secrets and will probably only ever know a fraction of the amount about Russia's darker deeds as we do about the US or UK. 
However, we hope that this video offered some insight into the secrets that Russia has tried to hide from the world. Leave a like and subscribe for more videos like this one. And check out our other videos exposing the secrets of other countries like the US, UK and Israel. For now though, be careful about how you use the knowledge you gain from this video. And keep an eye out for any suspicious looking umbrellas. You never know what's hiding inside them.